Okay, so hello everyone. We've been asked to do a demo project uh, just to show off uh, a simple use case of Mesos. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the time in the world, so we can't do anything too extravagant. But um, this should hopefully show everyone, you know, the types of things you can do, what things look like, and um, how to, if you've not used Mesos before and you want to dive in, this is a good like introduction. So you can probably copy what we've done, maybe do it yourself, have some fun on the weekend, whatever. So, um, if anyone has any technical questions or any questions in Dutch, I have my Dutch giant here who can translate it to me with interpretive dance, um, which I've been told after the last company um, meeting we had, I got very good at, so we'll see. Uh, so, the people who were involved in this project is uh, Willem, here at the top. He's uh, one of our infrastructure engineers, and uh, he's the guy who does all of the uh, networking and load balance and stuff. So, don't ask me any of those types of questions. Uh, Daniel, um, he should have been here, but unfortunately he prefers the company of his girlfriend. And unfortunately, you guys don't compete, um, but it turns out me and Willem don't have such company, so that's why we forced the volunteers. <laughs> and then there's me at the bottom here, so hello. And yeah, so we can go on to the next slide. Yes, Jasper has got this uh, little uh, lunchbox, and there's a green one over there as well. So, I like to play with Raspberry Pis in my home, I got a few of them, uh, turn on the lights on and off, uh, play with temperature, and so on, uh, do some little experiments. I don't like to solder, so I just buy the, the little things that you can click onto it, that's way easier. Because I like to play around with the software, not too much with the hardware, but of course you need some hardware. Uh, we work for a company that does uh, stuff with IoT. Can't really talk about that, so that's why we got those devices. This is also an IoT device, it's in a small Raspberry Pi Zero. It has a, a sensor on there. The, you see the blue thingy, that's the actual sensor. Is it actually blue, Jasper? Uh, yeah. yeah, the sensor on there is actually blue, so if you want, you can pass around the, the box as well. And that's actually a temperature and humidity sensor. And this thing runs a small Python script and is connected to the Wi Fi. Uh, and sends that readings to an MQTT broker. MQTT broker is a lightweight protocol to send messages, mostly used for IoT uh, use cases. It's powered by a little power bank, so it can move all around. And, uh, it has a fancy LID, but will come in handy later, because that one is green and Jasper got the red one. Or maybe Jasper wants to pass it around as well. Uh, so this is a small device. Uh, the Python code is like 10 lines of code. Uh, where we take the reading, plus you use some libraries, take the reading and publish it to, uh, to MQTT. Make sure the server stays up with systemd. If it fails, we just restart it, and most of the times so that uh, works. So it's nice and easy. Well, we're here for DCOS, so uh, Michael explains uh, how we do that. Uh, so this is a simple slide, which is why I'm doing it. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, our infrastructure on Amazon. Um, and uh, we're using the, uh, the default uh, uh, cloud formation uh, script, which you can uh, get from um, the Mesos website, which is, you know, if you just want to get going and want something simple so you can play around on the actual Mesos website, you, can, uh, you can uh, uh, create your own local uh, cluster using uh, Vagrant on your own machine, if your machine is powerful enough. Um, if you need a bit more juice, uh, you can uh, go to one of the cloud providers, you just uh, Click on one of them, this is uh, going to start the uh, CloudFormation script in AWS, so if you just want uh, you know, a single master cluster, just want to play around, click it, I see a uh, very scared face over there, but you know, <laughs> you just want to get going, this is how you do it. And uh, if you've got a credit card, you'll get going. Oh yeah, exactly, if you've got money. <laughs> but uh, so we have uh, a little cluster running on Amazon, which uh, if you go back to the slides, um, this is what we have running on Amazon. It's very simple. We have one master node, one public node, and two private nodes. And this is how the data ingests. So wherever the nodes are, I see the green ones there. I don't know where the one went. There we go. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, this is the red one here, and that's the green one there. Very simple. And we're pushing the data uh, through Malcolm LV, which is our load balancer, to Mosquito, uh, which passes it through to uh, the service we have running Akka. And finally, after Aqua has processed the data, it passes on to InfluxDB. So um, it's a very simple uh, 
ingest the data, but it helps you uh, see how the uh, clusters can be scaled out and uh, get a feel for what actually you know you can do on these US methods. Yeah. The, this Akka app, this written in Scala, it does a very simple job. It takes a stream of data from an MQTT topic, it subscribes to that one, streams it, uh, transforms it to a useful format, because we have some raw JSON, but you could, could imagine having an IT device that's very limited in power, and doesn't uh, support large messages or large memory, so you use some binary protocol, and you can do some decoding there in place. Uh, in this case, we just transformed the JSON to some useful format for InfluxDB, and then we have another actor system on Akka that publishes it to InfluxDB. Nothing special there. Every message that comes in on our broker, we transform it and put it into InfluxDB. Well, why InfluxDB? InfluxDB is a time series database, so if you've got measurements, they mostly got a timestamp, uh, the degree Celsius and the humidity level in percentage. And uh, with InfluxDB being a time series database, you can easily aggregate over all the data and display that. Yeah, just storing data, we don't have anything useful there. So we also want to show something. Uh, that's where Grafana comes in. We, uh, for easy dashboarding, you can connect literally any data source to Grafana and make some nice graphs and dashboards. Well, Grafana also runs as a container on DCOS, and we use again Marathon OP to uh, expose that app to the internet, to the user. Well, how does it look like? Well, uh, we've got a green sensor, those ones are green, the other one is red. I don't know where green is at the moment. It's next to the window, so it's a little colder. Pedro is uh, blowing his hot air over <laughs> the red one. Yeah, it's, it's getting way hotter. <laughs> and you see, the data is coming in real time, it refreshes every second. And every second, you see a few new measurements coming in. Here, you can see the red one popping up already a bit. So, it doesn't take much time. As soon as the temperature rises on that device, there's like a few seconds delay between that device reporting the temperature and Grafana showing it. Uh, bear in mind, the cluster itself is running on Amazon, so we publish a message, goes over the Wi-Fi, goes to Amazon, we process it, and then we show it to Grafana again. And it will within a few seconds. We have some uh, historic data. You say, showing the last seven days. But I didn't implement uh, the restart feature on the system D server, so some internet thingy went lost somewhere and broke. But now I implemented uh, the restart when it gets a failure. So those empty spots shouldn't happen again. Well, you wonder how all that looks because. Michael promised something, promised something with DCOS. Of course, that's why we're here. You want to tell something quickly about this? Um, this is DCOS, and I'll pass you over to my DCOS expert. <laughs> <laughs> now here you got some basic dashboarding, so you see the amount of CPU used, memory and disk. We don't use any disk at the moment, I see. And we got five tasks, and we only got three actual nodes where we can run some workloads. Now, what runs on there? Servers, we got Grafana in the container, InfluxDB, the IoT collector, that's the Akka app collecting the data from Mosquito and sending it to InfluxDB. We got MarathonLB and Mosquito. Well, for some of these, you see this fancy uh, label in front, and those come from the catalog, the universe, the app store that uh, pa uh, talk about, talked about. And here you can see the certifieds, which are uh, certified by Mesosphere, and all the open source from the community. Just one click, wait a few seconds, pops up. So that's really easy, because then we don't have to configure InfluxDB and MarathonLB ourselves, for example. We also have Grafana in there, but Daniel encountered some problems there, so we just took the raw Docker image and that one went up immediately, but we didn't care about into looking into it. So. That's why we chose that one. So, like I told you, the Marathon LB is in a universe package, which you simply can install. And it automatically exposes your applications. Not every app, you have to give it some special configuration. But the developers themselves can specify how this app should be accessed externally. Um, 
The marathon will be run on the public ones, on the public slaves, that have an uh, Amazon load balancer in front, so you can also have multiple public slaves. And that one connects to the apps, and it knows which app to reach through the marathon state itself. So it reads the marathon API, and based on that, it exposes the apps. Well, how does it look in the config? Let's open up Grafana. So, the only thing you have to do is provide some labels. I provide the HA proxy group because internally Marathon LB is HA proxy, which we all know. We put it in an external group so it's accessible over the internet, and we give it a vhost. Well, this is possible with Grafana because it's HTTP traffic, so we can inspect the headers, and based on that, we can route the traffic. You can do some more complicated routing rules as well. But for that, you will uh, need to consult the documentation. Um, for Mosquito, we can't do the trick with the vhost because it's TCP traffic, so we don't have the HTTP headers to assign a vhost. So we need some other configuration for that. We just put it in a TCP mode and use the uh, assign a CNAME record to the load, Amazon load balancer, and then we can simply uh, access it. And that's the only thing you have to do. There's one more special thing that you have to do, is define the service port. Because by default, Marathon will be able to on port 80 and port 443 for HTTP and HTTPS traffic. We want this port is mostly used by uh, MQTT. So if you define the container port, that's the actual port where your application is listening. And we define the service port, so Marathon will be exposed over that port. And that's the only config you have to do, to configure this load balancer. So you can, you can call me a load balancer expert, but of course, it's this easy. <laughs> so great, isn't it? So great. <laughs> and if you, if you go back again to the, uh, the page and you go over to nodes, uh, we can actually see, uh, you know how I showed you before, you know, the uh, public and private nodes. Uh, down here, we should see this node here, and you'll see one task running on it. And that's the uh, Marathon LB, which we just covered over. That's the only thing running on the public node. And if you look back on the uh, nodes again, you can see uh, the stuff we have on the private nodes. So, uh, for example, on this private node, we have the, uh, the Yakka service and the Mosquito service. Um, and the other one, I imagine, has Grafana and um, the database in FluxDB. So you can see, you know, you, you personally don't have to worry with Mesos, you know, where your resources are being started and where things are running, because it manages it all for you. I mean, it's useful to know what nodes are on, you know, in case things do go wrong, but ultimately, you know, it manages everything for you and you just let it do its thing. You just go to the dashboard to see there's yeah. so much CPU left, so I can still use that. So improvements. Um, this is, you know, obviously just a simple uh, demo application. Um, uh, there is uh, several things you can do to, you know, help scale it out because the wonderful thing about using, you know, uh, container orchestration or your resource management and things like this is how much you can scale it. Um, and you know how uh, you brought out, you can scale outwards. Um, obviously, that's the uh, big uh, concern we have in IT because it's getting to the point where scaling upwards is becoming, you know, harder and harder and harder. And there's more bottlenecks of uh, resources that just, you know, uh, become such a pain. Um, we're using, um, well, first thing, uh, Kafka, we can uh, buffer the raw data. Um, and uh, we can, you know, use uh, Kafka streams instead of Akka to. Uh, uh, transform the data. Um, the other thing uh, you can do with uh, Kafka is also we could uh, separate hot and cold data. So um, I'm not sure if you can do it with uh, Grafana, but if we had our own graphing solution. Uh, instead of uh, relying uh, on the data to have already been written to the database, we could use hot data from Kafka directly to write directly to the live service. Um, on top of that, um, that's another point I want to make about Kafka. Um, oh yes, um, uh, we could also use the uh, the um, um, and the other thing is, is that we were using Marathon LB in the uh, the example we gave. And the main reason why we were using Marathon LB is because you can set up Marathon LB for free. Um, there is uh, Edge LB, which is, as I understand it, for enterprise only. And the wonderful thing about Edge LB is that. Um, You'll see here we have uh, pools, 
um, and you can scale out the pools uh, which are responsible for load, uh, being a load balancer for your uh, applications. Because um, if you go back to the Marathon LV graph before, you would see um, you talk to Marathon LV directly. And the problem with this is when we're talking about huge uh, clusters, uh, Marathon LV just it can't cope, it dies basically. So being able to scale everything out with Edge LV is quite important and also the fact that Edge LV uh, integrates quite well, uh, well with uh, Mesos frameworks as I understand. Um, any other previous you want to mention? Uh, yeah, for HLP, for Marathon, you define it as a developer per servers. And at HLP, at the moment, you define mostly the ops people, yeah. uh, define centrally, so not every developer can just expose an application over the internet over some port. But here, you have more control over what gets exposed. You can do some complicated rewrite rules, have different pools for, for MQTT and for uh, HTTP traffic, for example. Which have a different need, different templates for HA proxy, different timeouts, uh, memory sizes. That's it's way more flexible uh, as well. A nice introduction to Mesos. Um, and we can go back to the Grafana after this so you can play around and see how it affects the graphs. Uh, but it's just you know, a small demo project just to show how easy it should be to scale everything out on Mesos. And all of the, uh, the instances we had, uh, for example, if you just go back to GCS quickly. Um, <laughs> Things should be able to be, you know, uh, scaled, and uh, you can change the um, scale like your instances and nodes. And as you scale things out, you'll put them, you know, obviously onto more nodes, more physical machines. And so you can, uh, as your application grows in use, you can just resize. It. And uh, the way we have it, you know, we can just spin up a new Amazon EC2 instance, it's get Mesos provisioned on there, and then bam, we have a whole new. Uh, set of resources to play around with without really having to be concerned about, you know, the crap, our stuff's gone down, what do we do? And we can just bring up a new instance just like that, very easy. Um, yeah, so we can go back to the graphs. People can just play around better. So that's everything. That's all the right, guys. <laughs>